Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the course on medical biomaterials. We will continue on uh, the analytical tools. We have been talking about uh, various physical, chemical and mechanical techniques for analyzing a biomaterial. Uh, today we will spend some time on uh, the tools which will determine the biological response. Okay? So, because uh, when the material is placed inside the body, there are going to be a lot of biological responses and we need to analyze some of them. So, today we are going to talk about it. So, this uh, picture shows a typical biofilm uh, on a material. Uh, we talked about biofilm quite a lot. You can see um, the cells here, we can see some uh, proteins, exopolysaccharides, all these. So, one is interested to know um, details about the bacterial biofilm. So, what are the various techniques? by which I can determine the bacterial biofilm. One is called the colony count. We can count the number of live and dead cells using this technique. Sorry, we can count the number of uh, live cells, not the dead cells. Um, that is wrong. So, we can count the number of live cells that is called a colony count. We can measure the percentage of live and dead cells using a fluorescent technique. So, I will spend more time later on these two. Uh, we can measure the protein amount, we can measure the carbohydrate amount. So, all these are quantifiable biochemical assays. We can also do a FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, which I talked about in the previous class um, to determine whether there are amides present, whether there are uh, OH group presents uh, and so on actually. So, this is how we analyze uh, the uh, biofilm on a biomaterial surface. Okay? So, we will talk about these colony count method and lime and dead cell later. Uh, how do you do the protein and carbohydrate? There is something called the Bradford method to determine the protein, the amount of protein that is present. It does not differentiate between what type of protein it is or molecular weight. Okay? Um, this tells you how much amount of protein that is present. It is called the Bradford method. It is a spe spectroscopic procedure and it can give you the concentration of the protein in a solution. So, what we can do is we can scrap the biofilm uh, from the material, uh, take it into a solution and then uh, using a Bradford method, we can find out how much the concentration of the protein. There is another method that is called Lowry's method. Um, this is good if the protein concentration is very, very low. Okay? This is quite uh, accurate in that, whereas Bradford we can go up in higher concentration. So, they, it gives you a bulk property, the amount of protein um, that is present in the biofilm say of say 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter dimension by using the Bradford or the Lowry's method. If I want to know the carbohydrate, carbohydrate is nothing but sugars, various types of sugars. What we do is we hydrolyze the polysaccharides into sh simple sugars by acid hydrolysis and we can estimate the amount of monosaccharides that are present in the biofilm. So, this is what you do, we hydrolyze the polysaccharides okay, into simple sugars by using acid hydrolysis, then we find out how much monosaccharides are there. So, the amount of carbohydrates, amount of proteins that are present in the biofilm can be measured by this uh, particular biochemical, two different biochemical assays. Uh, colony count and live and dead cells, we will talk about it later. If you are interested in uh, looking at the antibacterial activity, okay, the antibacterial activity of a material, there is something called a disc diffusion method or zone of inhibition method. Okay, so, it is also called agar diffusion test, antibiotic sensitivity test against bacteria. So, the different names are there. So, what we do here in this method is, um, we can have disc containing either antibiotics, antibacterial nanoparticles, they are placed on an agar plate where the bacteria is growing. So, we make the bacteria to grow on the agar plate. Um, no, we actually uh, plate the bacteria on the agar plate, then we can play, keep these discs containing antibiotics and antibacterial or nanoparticles and then um, we, we will incubate this, antibiotics will stop the bacteria from growing or kill the cell. So, there will be an area around it where the bacteria is not growing. Okay? 
as you can see here there will be area around it where the bacteria is not growing. Um, so, uh, this tells you how strong is the antibiotic or antibacterial activity of the material which are testing. So, larger the diameter of the zone clear zone then we can say it is got a higher antibiotic activity smaller the diameter of the zone then uh, it means the antibiotic activity is very low. So, how do you do this? Um, we take an agar plate uh, we will uh, put in the bacteria spread it all over and then we take a disc containing the antibiotic or antibacterial material or nanoparticle which we are trying to test um, the activity we will place it here ok. Then we will incubate the whole plate for say 24 hours and then see uh, whether there is a zone clear zone produced. Clear zone indicates that the bacteria has not grown near that because of the action of the antibiotic. Larger the diameter as you can see here larger the diameter and that means more is the antibiotic activity smaller the diameter then less is the antibiotic activity. This is a very simple and fast way of checking uh, if you are designing any antibacterial surfaces ok or antibiotic surfaces. This is called a disc diffusion method or zone of inhibition method uh, ok or agar diffusion method and so on. So, there is another way where you do it based on colony count method ok. That means, uh, you can find out how much is the live colonies present um, on in a biofilm or in a solution ok. So, colony forming unit that is CFU which is represented in different way is a unit used to estimate the number of viable bacteria or fungal cells in a sample. So, here we are measuring viable bacteria we are not measuring uh, dead bacteria only live viable. So, what we do is um, culture the microbes on a plate and then count the viable cells that has grown. So, if you find a too much uh, dense population uh, we dilute the solution ok. So, that uh, for example, when you dilute and again plate it and then culture it we can very clearly see the um, separate colonies because here we are not sure that whether it is uh, only um, so many colonies or whether there are clump. Uh, so, what we do is we dilute it. So, we can dilute it to 10, 10 times um, 1 fold we call it that means a 1 tenth dilution or we can do a 2 fold that means 100 or 3 fold 1000 until you get very clear like this until you get very clear single colonies which you can count ok and then you can multiply by the number of times you have diluted ok. So, um, instead of uh, counting in this uh, particular plate because you do not know whether there is only single uh, colony or there are multiple colonies keep diluting it diluting it until you get it very clearly and well separated out colonies. This is called the colony count method in this method uh, we can find out the number of live bacteria ok. So, here we cannot uh, find the number of dead bacteria. If you want to find out the live and dead cells in a biofilm for example, on a surface we use two different dyes ok. We have two dyes they are fluorescent dyes one is called uh, the green fluorescent nucleic acid stain SYTO9 another is the PI propidium iodide ok. So, this particular dye green fluorescent dye SYTO9 it penetrates live and dead cells. Okay. Whereas, uh, the propidium iodide it penetrate propidium iodide penetrates only dead cells ok. So, whereas, uh, the green fluorescent penetrates both live and dead cells ok. So, propidium iodide penetrates this is a fluorescent method. So, we when we look under a fluorescent camera um, whatever is green we can say it is the live cell when whatever is red we can say it is the dead cells because propidium iodide penetrates only the dead cells ok and um, it sort of neutralizes the green that is present inside. So, wherever you have green we can say it is alive and wherever it is red we can say dead. So, we can get a ratio of live to dead. So, if I have a biomaterial um, I add these two dyes incubate it and then uh, look under a fluorescent and then I can see how much green is there how much red is there. I can do a surface modifications um, and then uh, see whether I can reduce the amount of live cells and so on actually. So, uh, dead cells are present because uh, maybe the surface is able to kill the bacteria. So, this is also a very useful technique 
it gives you both the idea of ratio of live and dead, whereas the colony count method tells you how much live cell is there. So, both these methods are complementing each other because um, uh, if the bacterial if the uh, bio material surface is having antibacterial property, then uh, you will see a lot of uh, dead cells also which can be seen using this particular technique. Okay, so, far we talked about uh, bacterial, um, we are also interested to know what is happening, what is the response of uh, uh, animal cells to a biomaterial and um, so you need to know the cell viability of the animal cell. So, if the animal cell comes in contact with the um, biomaterial, what will be the percentage cell viability? There is an assay called MTT assay which access assesses the cell metabolic activity. So, if the cells are live, they have a certain metabolic activity which can be assessed using this particular assay. What is this MTT? Okay, so, MTT is a tetrazoleum dye, okay, this is the um, name for this, it is a dimethyl thiazole diphenyl tetrazoleum bromide. Okay. So, what happens is uh, when the cells are metabolically active, there are some enzymes like cellular oxidoreductase enzyme okay, which work on this particular dye. So, these enzymes are NADPH dependent cellular oxidoreductase enzymes and these enzymes sort of reflect the number of viable cells present. So, if the viable cells are very high, the, the, the enzyme activity will be also will be high, very high. Okay. So, these enzymes reduce this particular dye okay, that is called the MTT to insoluble formazon like this you know. So, this is the MTT and um, the uh, oxidoreductase enzyme um, they reduce okay, to insoluble formazon and uh, which is measured using a colorimetric uh, technique. Now, these enzymes are present in the cytosolic compartment of the cell. So, um, by incubating uh, the biomaterial with the animal cells okay, uh, and then later on you add this dye and again you incubate it and then the formazon crystals which you produce you sort of solubilize it and then using a colorimetric uh, you find out how much it is. So, um, that the amount, the extent of uh, the enzyme activity uh, is a measure of the amount of viable cells that are present. Um, so, if uh, the biopolymer or uh, biomaterial is toxic, you will have less viable cells. Uh, so, you will have less of this enzyme, whereas if the uh, material is not toxic, you will have more of the um, cell viable cells and hence the enzyme activity will be also more. So, this is how the assay MTT works. Okay, for, for example, if you look at this uh, uh, graph, I am, I am testing two polymers and seeing um, which one is uh, cytotoxic and which one is not uh, against say a L6 myoblast cells. L6 myoblast cells are present in the human uh, tissues um, and muscles. Okay. So, for 24 hours what you do is you take these cells and um, you take this uh, particular polymer, incubate it and then um, you later on you may add this dye and uh, you get the formazon crystals. Okay. Then uh, with respect to the control, you see how much of this is formed and from there you can say uh, what is the cell viability. So, percentage of cell viable with respect to control. Control is without any polymer, just the cells growing. So, here we see 100 percent. That means, uh, this particular polymer uh, is not um, toxic to the cells. That means, cell viability is maintained. That is why you get 100 percent. Whereas, if you take this polymer, we get around say about um, 80 percent. That means, 20 percent of cells have died uh, because of this polymer. So, this polymer is toxic with respect to uh, ki um, killing almost 20 percent of cells. Okay. So, this is how um, we do this particular assay and it is very useful because uh, a polymer a material when it is placed inside the body, um, it, should not, it should not be cytotoxic uh, uh, to the cells, the animal cells. So, the first step is we do this uh, type of experiment uh, to see whether um, it is showing a 100 percent cell viability or less. Generally about 90 to 100 is okay. 
even 85 to 100 is also okay. If the cell viability comes down below 85, then you can say the material is cytotoxic. So, we need to reduce the cytotoxicity of the material so that the cell viability increases further. So, the viability is calculated with respect to the control. Control does not have any biomaterial placed, okay. So, it is the normal cells growing. So, this is called MTT assay, which is uh, looking at the activity of this oxidoreductase enzyme, which is a reflection of the viable cell present. There is another assay that is called MTS assay. This is also a colorimetric assay, okay. It also measures the proliferation and cytotoxicity um, of the material. So, this is based on the reduction of MTS tetrazoleum compound. So, here we use uh, in the previous case we used that MTT bromide, here we use MTS tetrazoleum compound. Um, this is compound is reduced by the cells, there are some enzymes called dehydrogenase enzymes okay, in metabolically active in cells. So, if the cells are active, you will find this dehydrogenase enzymes which will okay, um, reduce this particular material to generate formazan and again uh, we dissolve the formazan and measure the uh, amount. Okay. In the previous case, uh, we are looking at the cellular oxidoreductase enzyme which tells you the cell metabolic activity that is the MTT assay, whereas in this MTS assay uh, we are looking at uh, um, reduction of met MTS tetrazoleum by the dehydrogenase enzyme. Again, it is a metabolic activity of the cell. So, two different techniques, um, it gives you an idea about the metabolic activity of the cells that means they are alive and because alive cells produced, uh, produce um, enzymes and we are monitoring that enzyme. Then uh, there is something called LDH assay is the lactate dehydrogenase assay. Now, this is a soluble cytoplasmic enzyme that is present in almost all the cells okay. and uh, when there is a cell membrane damage or plasma membrane damage, this is released into the extracellular space and you are measuring that. So, the measure of that is an indication that the membrane of the cells are damaged. Okay. So, how do the cells die? Cells die because of two different mechanisms, one is called apoptosis, another is called necrosis. Apoptosis is the normal cell death and that is a programmed cell death, all cells are supposed to die through apoptosis. Necrosis can happen because of a certain toxicity, cancer and so on. Okay. Uh, it is generally happening because of disease pathology, apoptosis is the normal. So, when the cells die because of necrosis, there is a permeabilization of the plasma membrane and this particular enzyme lactate dehydrogenase is released. So, you measure how much is released in the extracellular medium which tells you there is a necrosis. So, your biomaterial may be causing certain necrotic um, reaction. Okay. So, this is also a very useful assay to find out whether the cell death is because of necrosis. So, you are monitoring the presence of that enzyme in the extracellular medium. Okay. Then uh, if you are doing uh, okay, tissue engineering, you want the cells to grow, differentiate, adhere, all those things. So, you can monitor the cell morphology um, as a function of time, maybe 7 days and see how the cells are growing, um, whether they are differentiating into spindle like form uh, or whether they are not growing or whether they are dying and so on. So, that is called the cell adhesion. This is more a qualitative in nature, you can monitor them using a scanning electron microscope over a period of time up to 7 days and so on actually. Okay. Now, uh, we can also look at uh, the biocompatibility of cells on a surface using uh, dyes like nuke blue, this is called a nuke blue stain. Okay. So, this dye uh, it stains the nucleus and uh, we can see whether there is a condensation of the nucleus under a fluorescence microscope. Okay. So, if there is a, a apoptosis and the nucleus condenses um, from this dye, um, we can see whether the nucleus is condensed that means the cells are dying because of apoptosis which is called the normal death. Okay. So, um, there are different ways of looking at uh, how uh, the biomaterial um, 
whether the biomaterial is cytotoxic uh, to the animal cells um, and sort of what type of mechanism uh, through which the cytotoxicity happens. Okay? Uh, so, uh, first uh, approach is this MTT assay, then comes MTS assay. So, we are uh, trying to look at the metabolic activity of the cells. So, if the uh, cells are metabolically active or live, um, we can look at uh, the act presence of enzymes, oxidoreductase and other enzymes. So, um, which is monitored um, using uh, certain uh, um, okay, stay, uh, dyes like MTT or MTS, which is converted into formazan. Okay. Then uh, we can look at uh, whether the cells are dying through apoptotic or necrosis by looking at a, a particular enzyme uh, that is called the lactate dehydrogenase. So, if the cells uh, are dying because of uh, necrotic cell membrane damage, this particular enzyme is released. Um, so, that is an indication of necrotic death, not apoptotic death. And then uh, um, we can look at how the cells grow on the surface, how they differentiate uh, into spindle form and so on, whether the cells are uh, growing or is the material is cytotoxic uh, or creating adverse reaction to the cells. Then uh, we can also look at uh, um, using a particular dye called the new blue stains, um, what is happening to the um, nucleus, whether they are condensing um, and be because of apoptotic or they are not condensing because of necrosis. So, different methods by which we can monitor the cytotoxic effect of uh, material um, on cells. Okay. So, um, for the past uh, three or four lectures, we have been spending a lot of time on looking at uh, various tools, huge number of tools um, in the area of biomaterials. You, you can see it is a mind boggling set of tools, um, analytical tools, uh, instrumentation tools for looking at uh, the material surface looking at material characters, physical characteristics, looking at strength of materials um, and then going into thermal properties of the materials. Okay. Then uh, if it is a polymeric type of material, you may be interested to know the uh, molecular weight. Okay. Then uh, we have uh, uh, microscopic techniques where you are looking at the surfaces of uh, materials, you are looking at the uh, biofilms that are formed, the morphology of the biofilms using different types of uh, microscopy. Then uh, spectroscopy techniques like uh, uh, UV visible spectroscopy, um, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy which tells you um, functional groups present, uh, type of uh, compounds or organic uh, that are present on the surfaces. Okay. So, so many different types of techniques uh, um, we have looked at and um, as I said biomaterial requires a lot of uh, analytical tools and analytical techniques uh, um, and uh, you cannot be expert in all these, uh, but uh, we mean they have to get support from different experts. Then came the biological techniques, uh, one is related to bacterial, uh, uh, so we looked at the biofilm that is formed, um, the characteristics of the biofilm like uh, number of live colonies, uh, ratio of live dead cells. Uh, the protein that is present, the carbohydrate that is present. Then finally, we looked at uh, response or interaction between uh, animal cells and um, the biomaterial, whether the biomaterial is causing cell death, uh, is there a change in the um, viable cells, uh, what type of uh, uh, effect it is producing, whether it is a necrosis uh, or whether it is apoptosis and so on. So, a lot of uh, tools um, have to be used if you want to be very successful in the area of biomaterial research. Okay. Okay, now, let us uh, proceed further. Um, as soon as a material uh, is placed inside the body, it uh, there is a biological response that is happening. Um, I did introduce little bit of it and of course, I think in the next uh, couple of or three lectures, we are going to talk a little bit more biology. Um, without uh, biological details, uh, you cannot become a, a real expert in the area of uh, biomaterials. It is not like uh, you just synthesize uh, um, a metal or a polymer and then uh, give it away 
uh, not bother about what is happening, what is the response between this uh, material with the biological fluid, biological components. We need to have little bit of understanding of that. Okay? So, I am going to sp spend the next 2, 3 lectures on that and you are going to come across many biological terms. So, you do not have to get uh, scared about it, but you need to know that. So, yeah, as soon as a biomaterial um, is implanted, uh, there are protein absorption that is taking place that we could call it uh, the initial, the fast response that takes place. Um, then uh, we have platelet adhesion that means all related to the blood components, um, adhesion and activation. Some platelet may get activated which may lead, it in, lead into thrombosis. Okay. There could be coagulation activation that also could lead to thrombosis. So, platelet addition or coagulation all related to the blood. So, one needs to know uh, in detail these aspects if uh, the biomaterial is a blood contacting device. For example, um, small diameter vascular grafts or large diameter vascular grafts or cardiovascular stents or diaphragms uh, or uh, heart patches. So, all these are blood contacting devices. So, you need to understand uh, some of these platelet adhesion as well as coagulation activation. If um, we are talking about uh, infection, um, infection can happen way irrespective of the location of the biomaterial. So, we need to understand about the bacterial adhesion. I did spend some time on biofilm formation um, which leads to uh, uh, persister cells and a uh, lot of infection. Okay. Now, if you look at the leukocyte adhesion and activation, complement system activation, all these leads to inflammation. So, a material which is placed um, also uh, because of maybe platelet adhesion, thrombosis, infection can end up having inflammation and finally, the material could get rejected. There could be a systemic effect um, and uh, not only the local uh, infection, but even systemic inflammation could happen. So, these factors lead to inflammation. So, we have many things happening, uh, blood contacting device undergoing thrombosis, infection happening um, at all parts of uh, wherever the biomaterial is placed. Uh, you can have inflammation which is slightly at a later date, inflammation having a, a local inflammation as well as systemic inflammation. So, so many biological uh, response responses happen because of uh, uh, the um, placement of an implant, okay. whatever be the type of implant uh, that is being placed. So, the protein adsorption takes place here, large number of proteins take part in the early stages of uh, the um, protein adsorption. Okay. Um, some of the adsorption is favorable uh, and some of them are not desired at all. Okay. So, protein adsorption. What is this protein adsorption? Um, within seconds of implanting the material, they, they come in contact with the body fluid. That means, the material coming in contact with the body, body fluid such as blood leading to all the blood protein getting adsorbed on the material. I did talk about fibrin, fibrinogen and so on little bit in detail in the previous lecture. right? So, within seconds that happens. Okay? So, these primary plasma proteins like albumin. Okay, human serum albumin, immunoglobins, fibrinogen and little bit of Hagman factor, high molecular weight kinogen and factor 8, um, B, F and all these proteins come in contact with your material and they start uh, interacting with the material get adsorbed. Okay? So, the many parameters influence this protein adsorption. Um, one of them is the chemical physical properties of both the protein and the surface that is the biomaterial surface and presence of other proteins on the surface. So, are there any hydrophobic proteins present, hydrophilic, any charged proteins and so on actually. Generally, protein adsorption is less preferred because it may elicit adverse host response such as blood coagulation and complement activation. Okay? And also in some cases I did mention bacterial attachment also increases if uh, there are some proteins uh, that are already present on the biomaterial. So, we would like to prevent that also in some situations actually. Okay? So, we will talk about all these uh, more in detail in the next class. Thank you very much for your time.